Thank you. We turn now to First Minister's question. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, can I take this first opportunity to congratulate all of Team GB on their Olympic success and wish all of our Paralympians the best of luck in the forthcoming Games. And also, <laughs> and also to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, let me also take the opportunity to say a warm congratulations to Team GB on their stunning success, uh, but also to wish all of our Paralympians every success in Rio over the next two weeks. I'm sure the whole chamber will agree that they are an inspiration to all of us and they do us proud. Uh, later today, presiding officer, I will have engagements to take forward the government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Can I ask the First Minister to spell out why the public will be made safer as a result of the Scottish Government breaking up British Transport Police and absorbing it into Police Scotland. First Minister. Well, of course, Scotland is being made safer uh, by the decisions of the Scottish Government and, more importantly, by the actions of our police officers the length and breadth of the country. Uh, we have a situation in Scotland right now where crime is at a 41-year low, and I think that's a credit to police officers working in every single community across Scotland. Now, as Ruth Davidson knows the responsibility for the British Transport Police is being devolved to the Scottish Government and given uh, that we have created Police Scotland uh, and ensured uh, an efficient running police service, uh, I think there is a strong case to also include British Transport Police within that framework while allowing them to continue to provide their specialist policing functions. Of course, uh, this will be the subject of legislation in this Parliament over the course of the next session, as I announced on Tuesday, and I'm sure all members will want to participate in full scrutiny of that legislation. Ruth Davison. Similar to the programme for government on Tuesday, not a word there on either why or how it would improve safety with the change. And I think I know why, because since the Scottish Government first outlined its plans, I've received a series of emails from some of the 300 serving British Transport Police officers in Scotland. And let me tell the First Minister what some of them say. This is from an officer with nine years' experience. If this goes ahead, the effect on policing services would be horrific. We are a specialist force for a reason. Cross-border crimes would potentially become unmanageable. Another police officer with 17 years' experience said, like many others imposed on us, this is a ludicrous idea with no consultation on those actually doing the job in hand. And another with 24 years' service. I cannot understand why this decision can possibly be made without full consultation with the travelling public or even Police Scotland. Added to this, the British Transport Police Federation said this week that this change could leave the whole network unguarded. First Minister, why is the Federation wrong and why are serving police officers who keep us safe on the railways wrong too? First Minister. We, we will fully consult and listen to all views. Let me uh, quote the British Transport Police Federation uh, just before uh, this parliament went into its summer recess. Uh, we are fully involved in the consultation process. Uh, in a blog in August, uh, Last month, the, the Federation Chair said, and again I'm quoting, it's fair to say we are achieving a healthy working relationship with the Scottish Government. So those are the direct views of the British Transport Police Federation. I'm sure there will be a range of views across the British Transport Police uh, and the wider public about the right course of action to take, and we will consider uh, that carefully. But let me direct very, very clearly the issue in Ruth Davidson's first question. She said, why? Well, integration will enhance railway policing through uh, giving them direct access to the local, the specialists and the national resources of Police Scotland, while ensuring that they continue to carry out their specialist railway policing function and retain the expertise and the capacity that they already have, but within that broader structure of Police Scotland. I think that's the right steps to take, but as we take that step, as we develop the legislation, it's, it comes before this parliament, then all members uh, will have the opportunity to contribute, and I'm sure uh, many members of the public, as well as members of the British Transport Police, will also take the opportunity to contribute as well. Ruth Davidson. Well, the First Minister says she's consulting on this, but as she well knows, she's only consulted on how to carry out the takeover, not whether it is right to do so. And the First Minister should know that the British Transport Police themselves have laid out two other more practical options that are still consistent with the Smith Commission. And the thing is, people might accept her reforms if the British Transport Police was failing, but the opposite is true. 83% of passengers say they're satisfied with the levels of safety on Scottish trains, which is above the levels seen in England and Wales. And no wonder, because crime on our railways has halved. 
So why is the Scottish Government imposing a reform that the police don't want on a system that doesn't need to be tampered with? First Minister. I think I've said very clearly the reasons why we think this is the right thing to do. Why is uh, this uh, decision on the table now? It's because of the devolution of responsibility for the British Transport Police. As Ruth Davison rightly says, that was uh, a cross-party consensus within the Smith Commission. Specialist railway policing expertise and capacity will be maintained and protected, allowing the British Transport Police to continue to deliver the excellent levels of service that Ruth Davidson has just said uh, they deliver. And of course, crime on our railways, just like crime across our country generally, is falling and is at some of its lowest levels. But by integrating the British Transport Police within the wider Police Scotland structure, we also give the Transport Police access to that uh, specialist and national resource that Police Scotland have access to. Now, that appears to me to be a common sense uh, way of proceeding. Perhaps it's so uh, common sense that that's why it eludes uh, the Conservative Party. But as we go forward, Presiding Officer, we will continue to engage with the British Transport Police Federation. And I would remind Ruth Davidson that they uh, appear to think that they have a good working relationship with the Scottish Government. I'm not suggesting that that means they agree with everything that we're suggesting we want to do but we continue to talk and engage with them and I think that's the right way to go forward uh, and all members of this parliament will have the chance to contribute in the legislative process as normal. Ruth Davidson. The shortened version of that is the First Minister thinks she knows better than police officers but the fact is well, it's very hard to escape the conclusion that when it comes to the Scottish Government good practice always plays second fiddle to pretty shoddy politics because the Scottish Transport Police Federation doesn't want this. Rank and file officers on our railways don't want this and the public sees absolutely no need to change. But just as with the single police force, the SNP government wants to grab more control and wants to ram this through regardless. Last week, the First Minister unveiled a massive listening exercise. But today she's turning a deaf ear to our police. Her government has made enough mistakes with police reform why won't she listen to those who are trying to stop her making another? First Minister. Well, firstly, this is a government that has protected 1,000 extra police officers on the streets of Scotland, while the Conservatives south of the border have decimated police numbers on the streets of England. Uh, point one. Point two, because of the dedication of our police officers. Crime in this country is at a 41-year low, um, and I think it's important to remember that and to give credit to our police officers. But, you know, uh, we're, we're always told... Uh, the, by Ruth Davidson that the Tories are going to be a strong opposition. I have to say we've not seen any evidence of it yet. But then she comes to this Parliament and suggests that this government can just ram through, to use her quotes, uh, legislation. Uh, she's always telling us we're a minority government, so if we want to get it through this Parliament, we'll have to persuade people of that case. That's what we will seek to do. And instead of coming to this chamber today and indulging in shoddy politics, Absolutely. perhaps Ruth Davidson could do her day job and contribute constructively to the process when it gets it's underway. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. To ask the First Minister when she will next meet the new Prime Minister. First Minister. I have no immediate plans, but I do expect to be speaking to the Prime Minister regularly as we continue to discuss the implications of Brexit for Scotland and the UK. Kezia Dugdale. Today we woke up to the news that 900 Scottish children had phoned Childline in the last year contemplating suicide. That follows official figures released this week showing yet more missed waiting time targets for child and adolescent mental health services. Can the First Minister tell the Chamber how many children and young people have waited more than 52 weeks for treatment since the start of last year? First Minister. Uh, there have been several hundred uh, young people waiting more than 52 weeks, and that is far too many. One waiting more than 52 weeks is far too many. Um, I actually think this is one of the most important issues and challenges that we have to deal with, not just as a government, although it's our responsibility, but actually as a society over the, the years ahead. Demand for child and adolescent mental health services has increased by more than 30% in the last two years. Now, actually, I take the view that that is a positive development, it doesn't sound like it, but it does mean that the stigma associated with mental health is decreasing 
and more people, in particular more young people, are feeling able to come forward for help. And indeed, uh, the figures that Kezia Dugdale has quoted uh, today from Childline, those are deeply shocking figures. Uh, but again, they do mean that more young people are coming forward for help. The challenge that poses for us and the responsibility on my shoulders and the shoulders of the government is to make sure that in the face of that rising demand, we are building up services to cope with that demand. And that is what we are doing. We've increased funding and resourcing for mental health services. And of course, we've plans to further increase that funding and resources over the life of this parliament. I thank the First Minister for that answer. In the summer, Labour revealed that 460 young Scots had waited over a year for the treatment that they desperately need. This week's figures see that rise to 608. That is utterly shameful and nothing short of a national scandal. But it is also just the tip of the iceberg. Because since January last year, more than 9,000 Scottish children have been referred to mental health treatment, only to have that referral rejected or denied. And we don't know why. And I'm sorry, First Minister, I don't consider that a positive development. So, can the First Minister explain why thousands of children seeking help have been turned away? And if she can't explain it, will she task her Health Secretary to commence a review? First Minister. I will ask the Health Secretary to look into that. Of course, there will be a number of clinical reasons uh, why people referred are, are not given, but These that uh, doesn't mean that there won't be underlying system reasons as well. I absolutely agree that uh, the numbers of young people waiting too long to access services is not good enough, which is why uh, I am absolutely committed, as we have been over the past few years, in building up services. You know, since this government took office, investment in mental health uh, services by the NHS has increased by almost 40 per cent. The number of CAMS, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service Psychology posts, has more than doubled in the period that we've been in office. And we're actually, we were the first country in the whole of the world that set a target for uh, access for children and adolescents to mental health services. So I am readily acknowledging that there is more work to do. That is why we set out in our manifesto, and of course the spending commitments we set out in our manifesto for the health service, we outstripped uh, those set out by Labour in their manifesto. As part of that commitment, uh, we have committed, as I said on Tuesday, to bringing forward a new mental health strategy and to backing that strategy with an additional £150 million of resources uh, over this parliament. So I I do not uh, deny and I do not take issue with Kezia Dugdale about the importance of this issue, uh, but I hope she will uh, acknowledge the significant extra investment and also the significant planned extra investment as well. Kezia Dugdale. Can I say to the First Minister that the ISD's report says it's actually clinicians that are making these referrals. To so to suggest that it's a clinical decision to reject those referrals, I'm afraid, is a weak argument and I would ask her to look at it again. And I welcome that £150 million investment. Labour's manifesto in May proposed guaranteed access to a qualified counsellor for every high school in Scotland. It would cost £8 million, a fraction of what she's committed to spending, and it is exactly the type of early intervention the First Minister tells us she supports. So given we're the only country in the UK without a national strategy for school-based counselling, can I ask her today to seriously examine Labour's proposals which we are publishing? And if these figures today don't move the First Minister to act, can I ask her what will? First Minister. I think that last part of Kezia Dugdale's question uh, was, was unfair because I think there is not a single person in this chamber that's not moved by any young person uh, coming forward seeking help for mental health issues. And to suggest that the government is not serious in its intent about tackling this, I, I, I don't think is a fair comment. Uh, I will consider all and any suggestions that anybody wants to make. And if Kezia Dugdale wants to send me a proposals, I will ensure that the Health Secretary considers them. But one of the things that is already being considered as part of our plans for a new mental health strategy is the provision of link workers in GP surgeries, for example, as well as in schools. So that is something uh, that I can say to Kezia Dugdale is already under act of consideration uh, and it's under active consideration of course by Maureen Watt who is the dedicated mental health minister uh, that I appointed after the election in May so there is an absolute commitment uh, on the part of this government to building up services to deal with the increased demand but I would simply say uh, to people across the chamber 
to recognise the context in which we are uh, talking about this. This is not about resources having been reduced. Resources have increased substantially. The number of people working in this area has increased substantially. I, I mentioned psychology posts. We're also seeing an increase, although this is a local authority responsibility, in the number of mental health officers working in Scotland. So resources are increasing. But because demand is increasing so significantly as well, we've got to do more. And that's exactly why we've got the plans that we have in place to do more in terms of the strategy and in terms of the resources that back it. We have a local supplementary from Oliver Mundell. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to help avoid 140 potential job losses at Penman Engineering in my Dumfrieshire constituency which last week entered into administration, and if she will guarantee that Scottish Enterprise will pull out all of the stops uh, and give future uh, financial support in order to help assist the administrator in finding a suitable buyer. First Minister. Uh, well, Scottish Enterprise is already doing just that. I was obviously disappointed uh, to hear that Penman Engineering had entered administration putting 140 jobs uh, at risk. And I know that this will be a really difficult time for those who are affected and, and for their families as well as for the local area. Scottish Enterprise is already working closely with the administration administrators to help them uh, find a buyer for the business and retain as many jobs as possible and of course uh, our PACE organisation uh, is actively engaged as well uh, providing support to those who may be faced with a redundancy situation they've already contacted the company to offer support in the event that redundancies do proceed uh, but let me stress and underline the fact that Scottish Enterprise is working with the administrators to try to avoid redundancies taking place and another local supplementary from Sandra White Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government proposes to take in light of recent revelations regarding the investigation into the Clutha tragedy. First Minister. Uh, well, I, I was very concerned to read uh, the revelations that Sandra White uh, talks about. My thoughts, and I'm sure the thoughts of everybody in the Chamber, continue to be with the family and friends of all of those who were killed and injured in the Clutha tragedy. Uh, following the publication of the AAIB report uh, into the tragedy, uh, the Crown Office is conducting further investigations into some of the issues raised by that report. It's also the case that a fatal accident inquiry will be held as soon as possible. And it's absolutely right that all of the evidence can be vigorously tested in a public setting and then be the subject of judicial determination. Uh, the Crown Office will continue to keep the families advised of progress with their investigation. And I would finally say uh, that given the, the scale of this tragedy, uh, given the impact it has had on so many lives, and indeed the city of Glasgow, it is absolutely vital uh, that the families affected get the answers that they so much deserve. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. I was, uh, I was disappointed earlier this week that the First Minister's colleagues at Westminster were unsuccessful in persuading the UK government to take action on the scandal surrounding Scottish limited partnerships, legal entities which are openly marketed as tax avoidance vehicles and which have been associated also with corruption and money laundering. This is a scandal which the Greens first raised last year in the Chamber and since then there's been growing attention to it including investigative journalism by The Herald and now a campaign from Oxfam in Scotland who are calling on all politicians to back their statement against tax avoidance in general and calling for action on Scottish limited partnerships in particular. The Scottish Greens support that statement. Will the First Minister give her backing to it as well? Uh, yes, I, I certainly support those uh, sentiments. I was also very disappointed uh, that the debate sparked by SNP MPs in the House of Commons uh, did not result in the action that I think uh, Patrick Harvey and I would have wanted to see. I was very disappointed that the Conservatives voted against uh, that particular amendment. It doesn't sit uh, well, I think, with the new Prime Minister's uh, stated commitment to taking on 
the unethical practices of, uh, of some uh, big businesses. So uh, I think we need to be firm in saying uh, that tax, uh, companies should pay the tax that they are due because those taxes are what fund the public services that we all rely on. So this is a reserved issue uh, and uh, Patrick Carvey is aware of that, but SNP MPs in the House of Commons uh, and the Scottish Government to the to extent that we are able to will continue to press for action in this area. Patrick Harvey. I'm glad to hear that answer and I hope that the Scottish Government will be vociferous in rattling the cage of the UK Government in this matter. I know that my colleague Andy Whiteman is in correspondence with Ministers about this as well and I hope every opportunity will be taken to use devolved responsibilities also where they connect with the issue of tax avoidance. I've also called for the Scottish Government to restrict the availability of taxpayer funded support to businesses which do indulge in tax avoidance, for example, by using tax havens. Given that the First Minister has this week announced a new half billion pound fund to provide loans and guarantees to companies, surely we have a right to expect that such taxpayer funded or taxpayer guaranteed schemes are not available to the corporate kleptomaniacs who indulge in tax avoidance. Can the First Minister give us a guarantee that such Taxpayer funded and government provided support schemes will not be available to tax dodgers. First Minister. Uh, well, I, I, I was in the chamber the other day when Keith Brown answered a question on this very point. I think from Patrick Harvey, although I may have got that uh, part of it wrong, where he said, of course, this will be an issue uh, we take account of in any schemes that we are responsible for. And of course, the growth scheme is principally designed to help small and medium sized enterprises, particularly ones that are emerging newly uh, into some of the emerging uh, markets that we have today. Uh, we will continue to press the UK government to do uh, and to take action uh, on the issue that Patrick Harvey uh, raises, as well as the actions that I've already spoken about uh, on the part of SNP MPs. He might be interested to know uh, that the Finance Secretary wrote to uh, Greg Clark, the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, uh, last month to ask the SLPs be included in the Central Register of People with Significant Control as part of the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Act 2015. So we will continue to press the UK government to take action where they have responsibility and where we have responsibility we'll continue to act accordingly uh, and the last point I would make of course which I know is a point that has been made in the chamber many times before uh, that where we do have tax responsibility we've put in place uh, some of the toughest anti-tax avoidance measures of anywhere in the world. We have a number of open supplementaries. Uh, James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, Ruth Davidson's office issued a comment on Christian Allard, the former MSP, questioning his right to comment on issues in his home constituency due to the fact he was an EU citizen. But rather than immediately apologise and withdraw the deeply offensive and xenophobic remark issued from her office, Ruth Davidson first asked her spin doctor to apologise, and when pushed, she last night issued a contemptuous, sarcastic response which in no way acknowledges the seriousness of the issue. Does the First Minister agree with me that, in the tense political climate caused by the EU referendum, all politicians have a duty to lead by example and set the right tone for political debate, and that Ruth Davidson should issue a personal public apology without further delay? First Minister. I saw Ruth Davidson laugh when James Dornan was asking that question, but I do think this is a serious issue. Uh, the remarks that were made uh, about Christian Arlard from Ruth Davidson's office suggesting that an EU citizen, even though they live here and contribute here, doesn't deserve a say about the community they live in, I think are unacceptable. And in the current climate, political leaders do have a responsibility to help set the tone. You know, we heard this week that the Home Secretary has had to assure the Polish government that they were taking seriously the concerns about hate crimes committed towards Polish citizens in the UK. How much are these efforts undermined when the leader of the Conservatives in Scotland so casually dismisses what are completely unacceptable remarks about EU citizens? So I think if another day passes when Ruth Davison fails to offer a full retraction and an unreserved apology for the remarks made from her own office, then the people of Scotland will be rightly entitled to question the character of the Conservative Party. Mur Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. During the parliamentary recess, we saw the publication of the GERS figures, which demonstrated that there is a union dividend worth 
£1,600 for every man, woman and child in Scotland, equating to more than £7,000 for a family of four in one year. The First Minister claims to be concerned about the impact of austerity. Why would she impose this super austerity on Scottish families by taking this money away from them? First Minister. Well, I know that the Conservatives are desperate to talk about anything right now except the uncertainty that they have visited on the Scottish economy in the form of Brexit. It is the Conservatives' reckless gamble over the EU referendum that is taken to the exit door of the EU against our will. And it is the Conservatives' complete inability to answer any questions about what Brexit might look like that is causing so much uncertainty for the Scottish economy. So I think it's about time. Instead of scaremongering about other things, we got some answers from the Conservative Party. Maybe the Scottish Conservative Party can answer the question Theresa May couldn't answer yesterday. Should we be in the single market? Yes or no? Yeah. Lee MacArthur. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Earlier this week, the uh, First Minister, in her legislative programme, uh, referred to the development of a strategic action plan uh, reflecting the significant uh, possibilities in terms of oil and gas decommissioning that will require facilities around uh, the country. She may be aware that Lioness, in my own constituency, is under consideration for the development of uh, such proposals. Uh, can she, I think, uh, drawing on the deep water harbour at Scapa Flow, and indeed the proximity to the North Sea, which uh, WWF have said makes environmental uh, sense. Can you give an assurance to me and to my constituents that in developing the strategic action plan, Scottish Enterprise will fully reflect the skills, the resources and the opportunities uh, for development of th those facilities uh, in that action plan? Thank you. First Minister. Uh, yes, I'm delighted to give that assurance. In fact, I will ask the Chief Executive of Scottish Enterprise to arrange uh, a meeting between relevant officials there and Liam MacArthur in order that the very legitimate and valid points that he's raised today are fully incorporated in that action plan. Question number four, Jenny Gilruth. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an update following the first meeting of the International Council of Education Advisors. First Minister. Uh, the first meeting of the International Council of Education Advisors was very successful and also extremely helpful. The advisors were able to share their wide experience of working in education systems around the world. The discussion was wide ranging, but it had a focus on Scotland's twin aims of excellence and equity for all children. Going forward, the Council will look in more detail at capacity building, collaboration and closing the equity gap, and it will meet again in plenary session in February. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the First Minister for her response. Teachers in the 21st century need to be critically informed with professional values, knowledge and actions that ensure a positive impact on learners and learning. Not my words, but those of the General Teaching Council for Scotland, the body which sets the professional standards for teachers in Scotland. Does the First Minister agree with me that head teachers and local authorities must work collaboratively in planning appropriate professional learning opportunities for all staff, thereby ensuring that teachers can engage with educational research to develop teaching practice and thus contribute to closing the attainment gap? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. Ensuring that our teachers are supported to have opportunities for professional development is absolutely central to giving children uh, the best quality education possible. Indeed, that's why this year we're investing a million pounds in master's level training for teachers. I agree with the General Teaching Council that collaboration and high quality professional learning opportunities are important and teacher professionalism and school leadership uh, will feature strongly in both the National Improvement Framework, it already does feature strongly, in the National Improvement Framework and Delivery Plan uh, by, that was published by the Deputy First Minister in June. So this, in, in fact, was one of the key themes uh, of the discussions at the Council last week was the importance uh, of supporting teachers to develop professionally as much as possible. Liz Smith. Could, could the First Minister confirm whether her international panel of experts has uh, provided the evidence that shows that there's a very strong link between educational attainment rising and greater school autonomy. First Minister. Uh, well, the Council met for the first time uh, last week and we are asking it to advise us uh, and give us the benefit of its expert opinion um, on a whole range of issues. Uh, but there is evidence uh, about uh, the, the link between school attainment uh, and the amount of autonomy that individual head teachers have. That indeed is why in the governance review uh, that John Swinney will publish 
next week. One of the, the key themes uh, of that that we will uh, then consult upon is how we empower head teachers and have much more responsibility uh, on the part of head teachers in our school so that they are able to drive the improvement that we need to see. So our Council of Education Advisors will of course advise us on the best ways of doing that as we go forward and scrutinise our plans. Uh, but that link is one uh, that I think we've already accepted previously in formulating our plans so far. Ian Gray. Um, it emerged this week that the, uh, uh, the only educational advice underpinning the Scottish Government's national standardised assessments amounted to four emails from two educationalists uh, and that most of their advice was not in fact taken. So even at this late stage, will the First Minister undertake to ask the International Council to examine and advise on this central policy? First Minister. Uh, the Council will advise us on all of these issues and it will do so on an ongoing basis. I have to say the last time I looked, although the way things change in Labour I could be forgiven for missing something, the last time I looked Labour supported the approach we were taking mm -hmm. on standardised assessments. Uh, standardised assessments, as I've said repeatedly in this chamber, are not tests. They are assessments to inform the judgments teachers make about the performance of young people. And it's important that they exist, I think, uh, to, to make sure that that uh, judgment is being informed in an objective way and that then we are given from that information that allows us to assess what the attainment gap is and set targets to close it so that we can be accountable to this chamber and to the wider public for the commitment we've given around closing the attainment gap. I'm absolutely determined that we will do that. Uh, we will take advice from our council and indeed from others, but we will be unwavering in our commitment to deliver the best education for all young people across this country. Question number five, Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what measures the Scottish Government is taking to reverse the reported decline in inward investment, including as a share of the UK total. First Minister. Well, we're looking in detail at the recently published uh, Department for International Trade figures, which showed a small decrease in inward investment to Scotland over the past year. These figures have a very different methodology from the more specific foreign direct investment figures published by Ernst & Young in May. The EY survey has placed Scotland in the top two locations for foreign direct investment outside London for the last six years. And it also showed that 2015 was a record year with 119 foreign direct investment projects secured, a 51% increase over 2014. Uh, and that reflects the important role that SDI uh, plays in attracting inward investment to Scotland. Uh, Scotland remains a highly competitive business location, but one of the key reasons inward investors come to Scotland is to get access to the single market. And that's why it's so essential that we retain that. Gordon Lindhurst. I thank the First Minister for that answer, and uh, I'm aware of the figures and the different studies she refers to. However, the DIT figures are the latest figures, and they show that the reality is that investment in Scotland is down 9% in last year, new jobs are down 23%, and Scotland's share of new UK projects is down from 6 to 4.9%. Now, it is not the EU referendum that can be blamed for this, but rather it is her threat, which hangs like a dark cloud over Scotland, of a further independence referendum. Now, the question is, the people of Scotland have spoken in plain English. No means no. When will the First Minister accept that? Yeah. First Minister. Well, the EY figures are for the calendar year 2015. The DIT figures are for the financial year 2015-16. So there's a difference of a, a few months in that. Now, let me just wonder, what was the uncertainty hanging over the Scottish economy in the latter part of financial year 2015-2016. The only uncertainty that was hanging over the Scottish economy at that point was the looming referendum on EU membership. I still remember 2014 when the Tories went all around this country telling people that voting no was the only way to secure European Union membership and now they're trying to wriggle off the hook because they have put that membership in such jeopardy. The uncertainty facing our economy now is the reckless gamble of the Tories in taking us to the EU exit door. And you know, for those who've caused the problem, to try to blame uh, those of us trying to find solutions is a bit like an arsonist trying to blame the fire brigade. The Tories should be utterly ashamed of themselves. <laughs> Thank you.
Jackie Bailey. I'm sure that the First Minister does indeed share the disappointment because after very positive inward investment figures, we are now seeing a subsequent decline. Um, we can argue over whose figures are right, but it is the case that inward investment projects are down, jobs generated are down, and when compared to the rest of the UK, we appear to be doing less well. Now, I absolutely disagree with Gordon Lintus. It is not a question that Brexit has no impact, but it is the impact of both Brexit and continuing uncertainty over a potential referendum that has an impact on inward investment. What will the First Minister actually do to address this? You see, it's not that long that Jackie Bailey did agree with Gordon Lindhurst because she also travelled Scotland in 2014 yeah. telling us that we had to vote no to protect yeah. our European <laughs> Union membership. And she really should reflect on that. Now, let me... Let me address directly the issue of inward investment because Scotland is a success story in inward investment. The EY reports going back six years show that. Yeah. Uh, in the new climate that we're in, we're going to have to work even harder to attract inward investment. That's why I announced in the programme for government the new investment and innovation hubs that we're establishing in London, in Dublin, in Brussels. That's why we are supporting Scottish Enterprise and SDI. It's why we're announcing uh, all of the initiatives we're announcing to support the economy. But, you know, Jackie Bailey can stand there and talk about uncertainty. The problem for Labour is there's one certainty right now if Labour doesn't get its act together. Uh, Owen Smith said it the other day, Kezia Dugdale has said it, and that is the certainty of Scotland being governed by the Tories for 20 years. And Jackie Bailey and Labour have nothing to say about that. So we'll go on with the job of supporting the Scottish economy and we'll leave, leave Labour to stew in the juice of their own making. Question number six. Question number six, Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will convene a working group of ScotRail representatives, passenger and disability groups and trade unions to review and report on the delivery of safer train services. First Minister. Well, we welcome the views of all parties and how we can further improve our railways. Elaine Smith will be aware of forums already established through the ScotRail franchise such as the stakeholder equality group and advisory groups, which include attendees from passenger and mobility groups. It will also shortly be publishing the accessible travel framework for Scotland, ensuring that disabled people are involved in improving all aspects of transport from policy to delivery. The safe operation of our railways remains our first priority. And of course, we must respect the remit of the independent safety regulator in overseeing the safe operation of our railway, uh, which continues to be one of the safest in Europe. Uh, the Transport Minister will be very happy to host a meeting with Elaine Smith to discuss this issue further if she's interested in, in taking up that offer. Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, well, I think real passengers in Scotland, in particular those with disabilities and the RMT members in the gallery today, will be a bit disappointed by that response that there won't be a working group convened. Can I ask the First Minister, is she aware that thousands of driver-controlled trains are operated by ScotRail without a second member of staff on board? Does she appreciate the guard's safety critical role is not just about operating doors, vitally important though that is for safety, but it involves numerous responsibilities around passenger safety, assistance, comfort and security. And uh, given the current suspension of strike action, I would be very pleased to accept uh, the offer to meet with the Transport Minister to discuss how we can guarantee the safest possible operating procedures on our trains. First Minister. Well, Elaine Smith raises very important issues and the Transport Minister will engage fully uh, in them both with, with her and with other members and with the RMT and other unions. I think it's important to point out, of course, uh, that in terms of driver controlled operation, uh, the Rail Safety Regulator and the Rail Safety and Standards uh, Board has publicly confirmed that it, in their view it is a safe method of working. Uh, and they did that because uh, Hamza Yusuf asked them uh, to reaffirm their view uh, in the context of the recent dispute. Now, positively, as Elaine Smith has indicated, industrial action has now been suspended uh, while both parties are looking uh, to work through an agreement. I, I hope that process ends in a positive agreement and uh, we can look forward to uh, a situation in the months ahead where passengers don't have any further disruption to the services they rely on. Question number seven, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister for what reason more than a quarter of training places in GP surgeries were not taken up by the end of the 2016 recruitment round. 
First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, I'm kind of surprised Alec Cole Hamilton doesn't know we're not at the end of the 2016 recruitment round yet. It is still ongoing. Uh, from the first round of advertising this year, three quarters of places have been filled so far. And even at this interim stage, we've recruited 4% more year one GP trainees than when the full recruitment process was completed last year. Uh, this summer, a second round has started, which advertised a further 100 places. And this takes the total number of places being advertised for recruitment this year to 439, which exceeds our target of advertising 400 places. And of course, this year, we're also offering £20,000 uh, bursaries for harder to fill places and when we take all GPs and training into account not just year one entrance the current fill rate for GP training is 92%. Alice Cole Hamilton. I thank the First Minister for her answer and nevertheless it is clear from these statistics that making places available does not necessarily mean that trainees will emerge to fill them. Indeed, in the years since Liberal Democrats repeatedly, repeatedly raised the GP crisis at FMQs, we have lost a further 90 to the profession. Now, one in four patients present to Scottish surgeries with underlying mental health conditions. Does the First Minister agree with me that we can relieve pressure on GPs' practices, particularly like those in my own constituency of Edinburgh Western, by stationing qualified full-time mental health practitioners, not just link workers, in every surgery in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, I do agree very much with Alec Cole Hamilton. It's a statement of the obvious that it's not just advertising places that counts, it's filling those places with doctors, which is why uh, I hoped he would have welcomed the fact that at this interim stage in 2016, we're already ahead of where we were at the end of last year's uh, process. So there's still work to be done, uh, but clear progress being made. And we're taking a number of steps, uh, including the bursary that I spoke about, to make sure that places in harder to fill areas are more attractive uh, to doctors to take them up. In terms of the wider point about relieving pressure on GPs, uh, that's of course why we are working with GPs to, to transform primary care. Uh, we have plans in place to put 250 community link workers into GP practices, which addresses directly the point uh, that Alec Cole Hamilton has made uh, about mental health support. Uh, we also have plans to ensure that all GP practices get access to an enhanced pharmacist. We're investing in an additional 500 advanced nurse practitioners uh, to bolster the skills of the profession. Uh, and also uh, looking to recruit a thousand uh, new paramedics to work in community settings, which help to take the pressure off not just GPs, but also our accident and emergency services. So I recognise the pressure on GPs. Uh, I also want to thank them for the incredible work that they do. And we're determined to work with them to make sure that we've got a primary care system and a health service generally that is fit for the challenges of the future. Question number eight, Gil Panderson. Signing off, sir to ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is ensuring accelerated funding and additional business support in light of Brexit uncertainty. First Minister. Uh, earlier this week I announced that we intend to use the strength of our balance sheet to establish a new Scottish growth fund. Uh, over three years this will provide SMEs with up to £500 million of investment guarantees and some loans up to a maximum of £5 million per eligible business. I also announced 16 projects that will support and create employment as part of our £100 million capital investment package. Uh, they include a £20 million investment in energy saving measures for homes and public sector buildings, £23 million to upgrade the higher education estate and £10 million that will go towards local economic development projects across the country. And all of that spending, of course, is accelerated into this financial year. Uh, responding to the Federation of Small Businesses, we've also created a new single point of contact for businesses in Scotland enabling individual companies to submit any questions or concerns they have about the impact of Brexit. Bill Patterson. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Uh, does she agree that it's high time that the UK Government followed our lead and announced their own economic stimulus package rather than continuing to brush off all concerns over the future of our economy by repeating their meaningless mantra of Brexit means Brexit? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Um, on the 10th of August, when I announced the £100 million uh, package, I called on the UK government to urgently develop its own economic stimulus plans. 
One month on, we haven't seen any <coughs> meaningful action to alleviate uncertainty. For goodness sake, we don't even yet know what the date of the autumn statement is. That is the extent of the uncertainty that engulfs the UK government currently. Uh, I have great confidence in the resilience of Scottish business, but there are real concerns that the damage to the economy and to jobs uh, from the Brexit decision and from the confusion of the UK government since then will be severe and long-lasting. Uh, this Parliament has given the Scottish Government a mandate to seek to protect Scotland's interests, and that's exactly what we will continue to do. Mike Rumbles. Could the First Minister reassure our farming businesses across Scotland that the shambles of this year's direct farm payments won't be repeated in the coming year because, never mind accelerated payments, I had farmers at my door at the weekend telling me that they still haven't received the payments that were due from the Scottish Government nine months ago. First Minister. Uh, well, as we have said previously, we acknowledge our shortcomings uh, when it comes to making payments to farmers uh, this year, and we have apologised for that, and I do that again today. In terms of uh, where we are as of uh, the 5th of September of 18,300 eligible farmers, uh, over 17,700 have got a payment, over 17,400 have been paid in full, and we've paid uh, loans to those who are still awaiting the payment. Of course, Fergus Ewing will make a full update to Parliament uh, next week on the 13th of September, and as well as giving an update on payments for this year, he will also set out our intentions in terms of the 2016 payments. Thank you, First Minister. That concludes First Minister's questions. Yes, point of order, Elaine Smith. Thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm sure that all members, well, at least backbench members anyway, will appreciate the, the new arrangements for First Minister's questions, which give backbench members more opportunities. Could I clarify, though, with you that supplementary questions on question three and question four don't have to be sent in advance to your office are more spontaneous. And could I also clarify that the, uh, you wrote to us about the subject matter. So could you confirm that um, although a subject might have been raised at general questions, that that wouldn't preclude it from being raised at First Minister's questions? And I give the example um, I had actually hoped to ask about the downgrading of Monklands Hospital and issue a request to the Health Minister to attend. That was a subject matter at general but it wasn't at First Minister. So is that the kind of question that would be in order at question three or four? Can I thank Elaine Smith for the question? And yes, she's correct on both points. Uh, the, uh, you do not have to submit the supplementaries that come after the final leader's uh, questions to me. It might help if you do, in the sense that I might be, if you think it's likely to increase your chance of being selected, but don't feel obliged to. <laughs> but don't feel obliged to. It might decrease your chances. And, and yes, if it's the same question as is on the order paper for First Minister's questions, you can't ask it. But if it's been raised in general questions, feel free to ask again. I hope that's helpful. We now move on to members' business. And I would ask members to leave quietly if possible. <laughs>